good evening. It looked like the illness has hit us there today. Uh, Brother Terry, Brother Josh, Terry, myself, and Sister Katrina Baker are the only ones that will be doing what's in your program. <laughs> but Matthew Goodrich was good enough to say that he had a sermon prepared. Be happy to bring it tonight. Uh, Brother Sutter called and said he got the flu, so he's not here tonight. And uh, to take Matt's place, uh, Brother Bruce Terry said he would bring our invocation tonight, so he'll be filling in for, for Matt in that regards. And for Brother William Baker, who also didn't show up tonight, his lovely wife did. We're thankful for Katrina being here for special music. But he's come down with something, too. And so Brother Chad Buttry will be taking our benediction. Of course, I'm Jack Evans, and I hope the Lord will be in charge, but I'll try to direct us as best we can. Our call to worship tonight, our theme, of course, is preparations for the second coming. And so the theme, uh, the call to worship I've chosen is Genesis, the ninth chapter, verses 22 and 23. It says, And this is my everlasting covenant, that when thy posterity shall embrace the truth and look upward, then shall Zion look downwards, and all the heavens shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy. And the general assembly of the church of the firstborn shall come down out of heaven, and possess the earth, and shall have place until the end come. And this is my everlasting covenant, which I made with thy father Enoch. Let us continue by following our program in hymn, hymn number 192. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we, thy children, who are desired to call, be called thy children, 
have assembled once here and once again this hour upon this day praying for your spirit to continue to abide with us much as it has all day and we ask lord that your spirit would come in such an abundance that you might bless our brother this hour even the brother that uh, i have traveled with and he is a good man would you give him that clarity of mind that strength from on high would you touch his heart and give us those things that we need to hear pray lord that you would continue to be with each one here that you might bless those ones that are hurting and abide with us all and humbly i ask it in the name of your only begotten jesus christ amen God, our eternal Heavenly Father, we come before Thee at this time to pause and give thanks to Thee for the many blessings, talents, and gifts that You have given us. Father, for we recognize that without You, we would have nothing. You are the creator of all things, and that give us life and give us substance. We're so thankful for these gifts and talents that we have, and at this time, we prepare to give back a portion of that substance unto Thee. Father, and whether it be through monies or through prayer, I pray that you would bless all those who are willing to give. And I ask a blessing upon those men in charge of this money that it would be used in accordance to thy will and bring forth thy kingdom on earth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. think our speaker needs an introduction tonight, Brother Matthew Goodrich, but I've got three 70s up here. I've got Brother Chad but Buttry and Brother Bruce Terry, and I believe that any of the 70s that probably can always stand up and share the gospel because that's their calling. They love to do that. They love to testify to Jesus Christ, and we're thankful tonight to have Brother Matt Goodrich to come and to share with us, and we ask this in your prayers. scripture reading this evening, I've taken it from section 16 of the Doctrine and Covenants, and I'm just going to read sections up, bits and pieces of it. I'm going to read 2A, 3B through C, and 4E through F. Behold, the world is ripening in iniquity. And it must needs be that the children of men are stirred up unto repentance, both the Gentiles and also the house of Israel. For behold, I command all men everywhere to repent. 
Remember, the worth of souls is great in the sight of God. For behold, the Lord your Redeemer suffered death in the flesh, wherefore he suffered the pain of all men, that all men might repent and come unto him. And he hath risen again from the dead, that he might bring all men unto him on conditions of repentance. And how great is his joy in the soul that repenteth. Wherefore you are called to cry repentance unto this people. <clears throat> Take upon you the name of Christ and speak the truth in soberness. And as many as repent and are baptized in my name, which is Jesus Christ, and endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Behold, Jesus Christ is the name which is given of the Father, and there is none other name given whereby man can be saved. Wherefore, all men must take upon them the name which is given of the Father, for in that name shall they be called at the last day. Wherefore, if they know not the name by which they are called, they cannot have place in the kingdom of my father.
and it shall be called Zion. I think she's got such a beautiful voice. Love her selections of music and that guitar. And I, I don't hear too many people, especially in church, play a guitar and sing, but that's one of the things I like. And so I always enjoy her singing. And I also want to thank Kayla. You know, I love the pieces she plays. She played at center last week, I think it was. And her music she played before the service, I loved her selections. And I heard her tonight. I said, I love these selections. When I walked in, I said, who was playing? I said, it's Kayla. Wasn't surprised. And then even when she played that piece for the offertory, that's one of my favorite pieces of music. So she's like in, in tune with my spirit with the music that she plays. Thank you, Kayla and, and Katrina. <clears throat> it's been quite an end of the week. I know uh, last... Uh, I think Sunday it was, uh, Jack asked me if I'd give the invocation for the service because Ray Setter was going to be preaching. He wanted to get a couple of 70s up. And I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'd love to hear Ray preach. I haven't heard him preach in a while. So I was looking forward to that. Of course, then Friday, Ray Setter called me and said he was under the weather. Uh, and so he was looking for somebody to take his place. And, but he had already talked to Bruce. And Bruce said he had his back. So I said, okay, that's good. But I knew that that was one of the ones they was considering, and I got to thinking about that Friday night and into Saturday morning, so I called Bruce yesterday morning, I said, you know, and he, sa he said he, ha he was going to work on it, he hadn't anything yet, and I said, well, you know, I've got one that's ready to go. And so he said, well, you got one ready to go, you take it. Now, I know, having said that, Bruce could have stood back here and preached a wonderful sermon. I know he, I know he would have. I know he would have. Anyways, the sermon that I have brought, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, me and Brother Darren Moore, we went to uh, Bell, Missouri, and uh, I ended up preaching the sermon down there, taught a class and preached the sermon, and this is the sermon that I preached down there in Bell. And, uh, and as I was preparing this sermon, I was talking to the Lord, because me and Darren were talking, and that's when I knew that I, because I thought he was going to have it because he was the one that was scheduled and he asked me to go with him and, and he, but he gave me the sermon. So I was asking the Lord, what did he want me to bring? And it wasn't long I had an answer. The Lord says, preach on repentance. And so that's what I preached on. And so that's what our message is going to be tonight is repentance. I'm going to talk a little bit about sin and what sin does to us and how repentance acts as a uh, alternate effect, how it, it uh, wipes out the conditions of sin, and, and, and we'll talk about some of that. And so anyways, uh, that's what I want to bring tonight, and that's what I was led to bring, and as always, I think the Lord was, was with me in this preparation of uh, the sermon. Now, um, and what brought that on me is because, and one of the thought processes that came up to me, we have a lot of scriptures that say, preach nothing but repentance unto the people. And so that was in the back of my mind, and that's what led me to this. And so I, I centered more on that, that to preach repentance because we're to preach nothing but. And so my good wife, I love her. You know, I, I tell her all the time, you know, when God made woman, he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing when he made woman. And that he made her to be our companion. Uh, every time, when, especially when I'm preparing a sermon or need something, and I've, I've got something that, that's going to be time-consuming, my wife just jumps right in there and does that part for me. 
And so I can meditate, I can pray to the Lord, and I can bring the things together, and, and a lot of that stuff that's going to take time, she'll, she'll put together. Well, she put together for me, a bunch because I wanted to look at a bunch of scriptures on repentance and preaching repentance, and she put on a list, it's like six pages long of nothing but scriptures that say preach nothing but repentance. And uh, I want to read six of those uh, for us tonight, just to set the stage and the foundation uh, for what the Lord calls us to do. Now, the first one is found in Genesis chapter 6, verse 24, and it says, And they were preachers of righteousness, and spake, and prophesied, and called upon all men everywhere to repent. And faith was taught unto the children of men. Then I'll jump to Matthew chapter 4 verse 16. And we read there. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The next one is found from the book of Mark, chapter 3, verse 22. But he answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, All sins which men have committed, when they repent, shall be forgiven them. For I came to preach repentance unto the sons of men. Then in the second book of Nephi, chapter 11, verse 103, Behold, I say unto you, Nay, but he hath given it free for all men, and he hath commanded his people that they should persuade all men unto repentance. Then Mosiah, chapter 9, verse 53, Yea, even he commanded them that they should preach nothing, save it were repentance and faith on the Lord, who had redeemed his people. And the last one is from the Doctrine and Covenants, section 6, 4b. Say nothing but repentance unto this generation. Keep my commandments and assist to bring forth my work according to my commandments and you shall be blessed. And as I said, this is just on the scriptures of preach nothing but repentance, and I've got like six pages of them here, one verses, but those were just a select few to show that the scriptures are full of the commandments to repent. Now why is that? Why does the Lord call us to repent? <clears throat> And we are commanded to repent and to preach and to teach it. Not only does he command us to repent, but he commands us to teach it and to preach it. And that's what I want to concentrate on this evening, as, as I've already said. When we read our scriptures, we find out that Adam asked this very same question. Why should men repent? And that's where I want to begin. I want to look at that scripture and I want to, sh to look at the answer that the Lord gave to Adam when Adam asked this very question. I want to turn to Genesis chapter 6. <clears throat> and I'm going to read, turn my page, I have that scripture in front of me. Verses 54 to 62, but I'm going to read it piecemeal. I'm going to discuss it as we're reading this scripture. But this is what the Lord answered Adam, starting in verse 54 of Genesis 6. And our father Adam spake unto the Lord and said, Why is it that men must repent and be baptized in water? So see, when the Adam first heard it, he, had, he asked the same question, why? And the Lord said unto Adam, Behold, I have forgiven thee thy transgressions in the garden of Eden. Hence came the saying abroad among the people that the Son of God hath atoned for original guilt, wherein the sins of the parents cannot be answered, 
upon the heads of the children, for they are whole from the foundation of the world. And what this first part tells us is that we are responsible for our own sins. We're not responsible for the sins of our parents. And to a degree, we're not responsible for the, kid, the sins of our children unless it is because we have not taught them properly and they didn't know because we failed to teach them. But basically, we're responsible for our own sins. It's our own sins we have to repent for. It's our own sins we're responsible for. And so that's what we got to work on. Bringing ourselves whole again. Make ourselves whole again by the re tone of repentance. And so that's what this first part meant when he told Adam. And in verse 57, And the Lord spake unto Adam, saying, Inasmuch... As thy children are conceived in sin, even so when they begin to grow up, sin conceiveth in their hearts. <clears throat> and they taste the bitter that they may know to prize the good. And so he's telling us that we're born into a world of sin. And because sin is all around us, sin conceives in our heart. Now, I think, personally, it goes maybe a little deeper than that. I think our natures, our nature is sin, is a sinful state, and that's one reason that we are here, so that we can change that, that we can change our nature. But he told us that, hey, we're conceived in sin. We, we, we're born and we grow in a world of sin. It's all around us. And so, one of the things that I have taken from this scripture, because you know we're commanded to repent and to be baptized, and the, as I was studying this one day, it came to me, just as sin conceives in our heart, when we're born into this world, when we repent and we are baptized, now then, righteousness can conceive in our heart, because we have a new birth. We have a new beginning as we are born in a world of sin and sin conceiveth in us. Now we're born in the kingdom of heaven because that's what we reread later here in Genesis 6. We're born into the kingdom of heaven. So now righteousness has the opportunity to conceive within us as long as we don't let the sin override it. It's still our choice, but now righteousness can conceive within us. <clears throat> verse 58, <clears throat> beginning again in verse 58, and it is given unto them to know good from evil, wherefore they are agents unto themselves. And I give, and I have given unto you another law and commandment, wherefore teach it unto your children, that all men everywhere must repent. And, of course, when he's telling Adam that, he's talking about all the children that are going to come forth from the face of this earth. Teach it unto your children to repent, that all men must repent, or they can in no wise inherit the kingdom of God. For no unclean, unclean thing can dwell there or dwell in his presence. For in the language of Adam, man of holiness is his name, and in... And the name of the only begotten is the Son of Man, even Jesus Christ, a righteous judge who shall come in the meridian of time. Therefore, I give unto you a commandment to teach these things freely unto your children, saying that by reason of transgression cometh the fall, which fall bringeth death. And that's one of the things that sin does to us, is it brings death. This fall brought death. So we found ourselves in the condition that death was upon us. And inasmuch as ye were born into the world by water and blood, and the spirit which I have made, and so become of dust a living soul. And so I had a note here that sin brings death. 
And we are on this path. At least that's the path we were born into. But repentance and baptism brings life. And the scriptures are full of that also. God wants us to have life, not death. Verse 62. Even so ye must be born again into the kingdom of heaven, of water and of the spirit, and be cleansed by blood, even the blood of mine only begotten, that ye, that ye may be sanctified from all sin, and enjoy the words, the words of eternal life in this world. So in this world we enjoy the words of eternal life, and eternal life in the world to come. And so I thought that was interesting. We enjoy the words of eternal life here, and we enjoy eternal life in the world to come if we've been faithful. And so we must be born again. As, as we were born in the world of water and the blood and the spirit, even so, we must be born again of water and of the spirit and cleansed by the blood. And then 63... For by the water you keep the commandment. By the Spirit you are justified, and by the blood you are sanctified. Now I have a note in here because I studied that word justified. And justified basically, it means a couple of things, but the basic one means to conform, to be conformed. Or in other words, changed. And so by the Spirit, we are changed. You could read it that way too. So, you know, by the water, we keep the commandment. By the Spirit, we are changed. And by the blood, we are sanctified. And so this is the answer that the Lord gave him, that we have come in sin, and because of the sin, we are now have that judgment of death upon our head. And the Lord wants to change that, so he commanded us to repent so that we can change that outcome. And that's what repentance really is, is changing the outcome that is upon us. It is bringing us back into the presence of God. And so, and I have, so what is this sin that is conceived in our hearts, and what does it do to us? What does sin do to us? <clears throat> when I look at the dictionary, my, my favorite dictionary to look at is the 1828 Webster's American edition because it was it came out around the same time that the church came into existence and so that's an understanding of the words as they were in that time as they were in that time <clears throat> and this is from that dictionary the first one sin is to depart from the path that God has established for us <clears throat> by transgression, doing those things that are contrary to the nature of God. And I didn't add any words to that. That was word for word what the dictionary said. And so I put on here a note that that is, it alters us. It changes us away from God. That's what sin does. It changes us and draws us further away from God because that's what sin is. It is departing from the path of God. And number two, sin is an alienation of the heart from God, of our, our very heart. And you know, and the scriptures tell us all the time where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so what's truly in our heart is what we treasure. And if it's sin is an alienation of our heart from God, that means God is not the one we treasure. And that's what sin does to us. And continuing in that, it is a process of turning from God and becoming his enemy. Again, that's what the dictionary said. So sin is that which turns us from God. 
It's that effect that every time we sin, we draw a little farther away from God. And we get farther away from God and farther away from God. That is what sin does to man. And that's what Satan strives for. He tempts us to commit those sins because he knows it, it draws us away from our Heavenly Father. And that's his intent to draw all the souls he can from God. And that is his goal. And that's what sin does. So sin is the altering of our beings to be different from what, from what God has created us to be. And that's what sin is. Since sin has done this to man, God has established a means to reverse this condition and to begin the process of changing us back to the original place that God desired and wanted for us to be in. That means and concept is repentance. It begins with repentance. Repentance is the way that has been established to reconcile us back to God. And that can change us to where we have no more desire to do evil. And so Satan is working on us with sin and trying to have us no more desire to worship and serve God. And God's trying to work us to a place that we have no more desire to do evil, to sin. And so there's two opposite ends of this pole here. You know, they're opposites. And we're being tugged back and forth towards one. But I trust that most of us here are on that right path. We're working through that reconciliation with God. Now, same dictionary, this is what it says about repentance. One, it is having our hearts and minds pricked to regret having committed the sin. And so our hearts and our minds have to be, be, be pricked before we can even desire to make that change and to, to ask forgiveness for it. If we don't feel that we did wrong, we're not going to make no effort to change that. We're not going to make no effort to ask for forgiveness. Our minds and our hearts have to be pricked. We have to see and feel that, oh my gosh, that was wrong. And we feel it within our hearts. And because of that feeling, we are now desirous to repent of it and filled with sorrow to do something about it. And so that's what true repentance is. It's, it's having our hearts pricked enough that we're filled with sorrow to do something about it. Not just, I'm sorry, Lord, but to do something about it. <clears throat> Number two, real repentance is to have a change of mind. And I find that very interesting. It's not just a change of heart, but it's a change of mind. It's like, this isn't good. I need to change the path that I'm on. I need to make a change here. This isn't good. And so we're having a change of mind that we don't want to walk down that particular road no more. We've been pricked, and we now have a change, have a change of mind that causes us to change the course that we find ourselves on. And so again, that's true repentance. It's not, I'm sorry. It's far enough that we want to change the course that we're on. We want to make that change. And that's because when we repent, we bring the Spirit of God within us, and the Spirit works within us. As I said earlier, uh, by the Spirit we are justified. Well, that means being changed. The Spirit works to change us. And so with that spirit, we begin to create a change closer to God. And number three, real repentance is also accompanied by and followed by an amendment of life. So we make a change in our life. Again, I know I've said it a couple times, but it bears repeating. It's not just saying, I'm sorry. It's to the point that we're willing to make a change. That is so important 
because repentance is something that consumes us. It allows his spirit to come within us and to work within us. And if we truly feel his spirit, guess what? We'll know the path we need to take. We'll know what we have to do with that particular situation to change it. Now, sometimes it takes a change. It, sometimes it takes something that we're doing, and sometimes it takes an effort to stop that. But we're pricked enough that we're going to do that process to make that change. So sin causes a change within us, away from God, and repentance causes a change within us towards God. We were in a state of sin turning from God, so we established a means to reverse that and bring us back to himself. So repentance is a mighty change in our mind, in our heart, and in our life, wrought by the Spirit of God. That's why repentance is so important. It works to bring these conditions upon us of coming back to God, and that is what we need. It alters what sin has done to us. Sin has altered us away from God. Repentance can alter us back to God and alter those conditions that sin brought upon us. <clears throat> now, I thought this was very interesting. We can even see this in the Greek word for repentance. And I, I hope I can pronounce this right. It's, it's a Greek word, as I said. It's meta, beta, metanoia. Metanoia is the Greek word for sin. Now, metanoia is composed of two words. Meta, which is meaning to change, and noia, which means mind. So metanoia, which is the word for repentance, means it takes the word changing mind, changing our mind. And what a better word for repentance. It, right here, we have a word that explains what it is and its very meaning of the word itself in the Greek form. <clears throat> change of mind brings about the change of our heart being filled with his spirit. And so when we change our mind, everything else follows suit. Everything else follows suit. <clears throat> so this act of repentance is more than asking forgiveness, but it has entwined within it all the means to bring a change within us. Repentance is part of the act of purification. Scriptures command us to purify ourselves, and repentance is part of that act. And pureness means being separated from anything foreign. Pureness is being separated from anything foreign. For if something is foreign is within, within this, like if I have a glass of water and I have foreign substances in it, it's not pure. That water is not pure. But when that water is clean, it is pure. There is no sin or anything mixed within it. And anything not of God is foreign. And that's just the way it is. Repentance, well, I've just read that. And the Lord is always teaching us and encouraging us to repent and draw near to him because he says that he has purchased us. And purchased in this sense means, and another word I looked up and I thought it was very interesting, to pursue to the end or to, obtain, or to the purpose obtained, has, hence to obtain. So Purchased in this sense of God means to pursue us to the end. So God is always pursuing us. He's always reaching out for us. And that's when he said, I purchased you. He died for, on the cross for us so that we might have that opportunity of repentance and to come back unto him. And so he purchased us with that blood and it's still our choice. So he's pursuing us to follow that path. 
He is pursuing us to follow that path and desires that our souls be filled with joy and peace. And true joy means, the true meaning of joy means to be in the presence of God. And that is the true meaning of joy. And so he wants us to have that joy, to stand once again into the presence of his Father. So repentance is not a means to punish us or to make us feel guilty. That's not what repentance is. But it's to bring the necessary changes within us so that we can have salvation. You know, and I was thinking of that this morning when Brother uh, Terry, when uh, actually I think it was uh, Josh after him, uh, Turner, when he said that, that when he was talking about that, uh, what they broke that, I can't remember what the word is now, but when they break it down, it comes to that central meaning. Chiasm, yeah. When that chiasm, and that chiasm is so we can have salvation. And that's what repentance works us to, so that we can have salvation. Jesus Christ died so this plan could have effect. He gave up his life. He asks us to give up our sins so that we can have life. Now, there's a song that was sung by a group years ago called Brother John. I don't know if any of you knew him, knew that group, but they had a song that's called The Call, one of my favorite songs. I've still got a, a CD at home that has that song in it, and I listen to it ever so often. But there is a refrain, that the refrain to that song is so touching. And that song is written of the Lord talking to us. That's why it's called the call. It's the Lord talking to us. And that refrain just fits so perfect. It says, I ran the race. I fought the fight. I am the way, the truth, and the light, and the life. I paid the price so you could be free. I gave you everything. What? will you give to me? And that just touches me every time. And he does a verse of the Lord talks to us and he sings that refrain every time. And it's so touching. The scriptures make clear what he asks for, what he asks of us, our obedience and repentance. It's up to us whether we respond or not. What will be your choice? Now, and it's not the longest sermon, I, I have a scripture I want to close with. And in closing, I want to turn to uh, Psalms, the 51st Psalms. Let me get it in here because I didn't put a bookmark in it. Yeah, I think I do have a bookmark in it. <clears throat> I'm not going to read the whole psalm, but I'm going to read a good portion of it. Um, and the, the psalm is titled... Prayer for remission of sins. And I thought it was a good way to tie this message up. <clears throat> Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. And that's what our sins seem like. Once we've sinned, they're like ever before us until we can blot them out. They can be blotted out. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. And sin, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. 
Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew in me a right spirit within me. And we all pray that when, when we are truly on our knees to our Lord. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy spirit. And for those who are following on, I'm going to jump down to the 15th verse. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou desirest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Amen and amen. May we ever strive for this repentance. May we ever strive to come back fully into the presence of our God. May God be with you in our efforts is my prayer. Thank you, Brother Matt. You know, uh, I think the Lord's trying to talk to us. You may not remember, but on February the 9th, Matt Damon spoke up here. He preached on repentance. That evening on February the 9th, I spoke on repentance. And now Brother Matt is speaking on repentance. So maybe the Lord is trying to get our attention. Maybe we need it. Now, on, on a lighter side, though, uh, I learned tonight, too, that I'm responsible for my own sins. So I got to quit blaming my wife for everything. <laughs> Let's close with hymn number 200. Almighty God, our loving Father in heaven, we once again come before your throne of grace and rejoice this day for your many blessings. And we thank you again for 
the spoken word that you have shared with us through thy servant this night. And indeed, we do pray that you would continue to prick our hearts, that we might always be found to have that uh, broken heart and contrite spirit. Lord, we pray that you would continue to go before us as we would once again depart ways, that your spirit would guide and protect us and help us that we would always be ready to witness for thee. For Lord, we uh, only know that it is you that, uh, as has been said, that we have such a joy in our life. And help us to share that joy with those around us, that they might indeed see the light that you've placed in us, that light that would lead them back ultimately into you. And so, Father, we uh, praise you this night, and we thank you again for this Sabbath day, which you have richly blessed us. And may you go before us and, and uh, be with us until we meet again, is our prayer. In Christ's name, amen. Mm -hmm.